Those of you who worshipped with us last Sunday will remember that I began a series of messages on prayer. Last week, I talked about the one to whom we pray, God himself. And this week, I'm going to speak the second message in that series, and we are going to look at the person who prays. And we are going to see that you and I need to be honest and lay our hearts open before God. I've entitled this message, Honest to God, Boring the Title, from a book by Bill Hybels. On your screen in front of you, you see a picture of Abraham Lincoln, or Honest Abe, as he was nicknamed. He was a U.S. attorney who served as the 16th president of the United States. Lincoln led the nation through its greatest moral, constitutional, and political crisis in the American Civil War. He preserved the Union, abolished slavery, strengthened the federal government, and modernized the U.S. economy, all the time maintaining his integrity and embracing his nickname. What is honesty? What do we mean when we refer to this president as honest Abe? Perhaps we could define honesty as that part of the foundation of our core values and principles. Honesty cuts through deception and knifes its way through deceit and lies. Honesty is not just about telling the truth. It's about being real with yourself and others about who you are, what you want, and what you'll need to live in order to be authentic. Today, people struggle with honesty. That may surprise you. So listen to this article taken from the Harvest Business Review. It was entitled, Why Be Honest If Honesty Doesn't Pay? It states, Economists, ethicists, and business sages have persuaded us that honesty is the best policy, but their evidence seems weak. Through extensive interviews, we hope to find data that would support their theories and thus perhaps encourage higher standards of business behavior. To our surprise, our pet theories failed to stand up. Treachery, we found, can pay. There is no compelling economic reason to tell the truth or to keep one's word. Punishment for the treacherous in the real world is neither swift or sure. This is not just a business ethic, but it's reflective of the way that we live, a relational ethic that's practiced day in and day out by most who live in our society. This article tells us that people in business are dishonest. We are reminded that people everywhere lie. Honesty is no longer a valued virtue. virtue. As inhabitants of this culture and this society, the one that no longer sees it as honesty, as an absolute value, we need to ask ourselves a very important question. How does this affect our relationships with each other? And more importantly today, how does it affect our relationship with God? Is it possible that we could lie to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords? Is it possible that we try and hide 
our authentic self from him and project to him who we want to be? Are we honest about our feelings when we talk to God? Today, we will discover that genuine Christianity demands a lifestyle that is authentic. And that lifestyle begins with being honest in prayer. Let me repeat that again for you. Today, we will discover that genuine Christianity demands a lifestyle of authentic, of authenticity, and this begins in prayer. As we develop that, the first thing that I want to acknowledge is that life is a mixed bag. And you listening to me this morning know this only too well. Let me state the obvious. All that happens to us isn't good. All that happens to us isn't good. You see, we live in a time of waiting, waiting between the already and the not yet. The time between Christ's death and resurrection and ascension into heaven and the time that we wait for Him to return to earth. During this time, we experience both blessing and curses. During this time, we are blessed to live with God watching out for us, but we also live during a time in which sin is rampant in this world. And sometimes we become disillusioned by that. We continue to ask the question of why does God allow evil to reign? Why does God allow the pandemic to occur? We continue to expect heaven on earth right now, right today. We do not like waiting. And yet, as we wait for Jesus to return, our life is going to have periods of pain and difficulty. Bad things will happen to us, whether we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior or whether we don't and live our life like He never existed. Bad things are going to happen. It's a byproduct of living in a sin-stained world. In the 70s, when I was a teenager, one of the most popular music groups was an American rock band called Nazareth. And they recorded a song that had been sung by others called Love Hurts. Now, I'm not going to sing it for you this morning. You'll be relieved about that. But I want you to know that it reached the U.S. top ten. And in Norway, it reached number one status. People could identify with its message. People had been in relationships of pain, relationships of difficulty. They have watched love turn sour. Well, I want to say today that if we're honest with ourselves, it's not just love that hurts, it's life that hurts. So the question for all of us is, as we live during this time when life hurts, who are we going to tell? Who will we share our pain with? Who can we trust to be honest with? My fear is that because of shame or because of fear, we only portray ourselves to God for something we would like to be or we should be rather than who we really are. We hide our true self from God and project a false self. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, 
The false self is an artificial persona that people create to protect themselves from pain, shock, and stress in close relationships. And so I ask, do we do the same with God? Do we live our prayer life out like if God knew the real us, He wouldn't love us, He'd reject us, and He would spurn us, and so we don't tell Him what we're really feeling? I read the story this week of a man who went to talk to his pastor. And his life was falling apart. He had lost his job. He had lost his marriage. His children would no longer talk to him. He was going into foreclosure. Life was awful. And at the end of the session in which he met with his pastor and explained to him all of this, his pastor asked if they could pray together. And when this man prayed, he stepped out of his circumstance and he prayed a very eloquent prayer that thanked God for his blessings, that thanked God for Jesus, but never once in the prayer did the man touch on his pain. It was as if he was trying to hide his true self from God. This was not the case for the psalmist. The psalmist in Psalm 69 laid his heart bare before God. I want us to look this morning at the psalmist example. This psalm follows a group of psalms whose focus was on praising God for His universal creative power and the authority that was acknowledged by all nations. And then the theme kind of switches. And Psalm 69 introduces a new grouping of psalms. Psalms that return to earlier themes of lament and pleas for deliverance from mocking and threatening enemies. The hope for divine rule over nations gives way to the reality that is something far less. Isolation, oppression, and ridicule by the enemy. Pain, all summarized in one word, Pain. Psalm 69 is developed into seven segments, and this morning I want us to look at the first and then the last two. The first segment is found in Psalm 69, verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4. Let me read it for you again. Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths, and there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters, and the floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Many are my enemies without cause, and those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. In this lament, the psalmist reveals the depth of his pain. He uses some metaphors to help us understand the agony and the torment that he was going through. He hides nothing. He lays his soul bare before God so that God could see and understand what was going on within him. He said that he felt like he was drowning. He felt like the water was coming over his head and that he would surely perish. When I was a minister in Clarks Harbor, 
I was asked if I would join the dory races, which was kind of funny for a New Brunswicker who had never been in a dory in his life. And it meant that I had to do lots of practice with my partner in order to catch up to people who literally spent their formative years rowing in one of these. It was fun. I enjoyed it. It was a challenge. But one day, my partner and I were off of the island, and we were at a place where the waves would often come out of nowhere. Now, if you know anything about a dory, a dory is almost impossible to upset. And most times, a dory rower in a race will put a seatbelt around their waist so that they can be held into the boat and can get a good push with their legs when they're rowing. Well, this New Brunswicker knew better. And he didn't want any seatbelt because it kept him in one place and he wanted to be able to arch his back and and get more pull. Well, I did that. And this one day, as I pulled in that dory, out of nowhere came a rogue wave. And it hit the side of the dory and it catapulted me right out of the boat and right into the water. Now I can swim, and I wasn't concerned even though it happened so fast. Until as I plunged into the water, the water began to turn dark. And I can remember praying and saying, God, I didn't come to Cape Sable Island to die like this. It's kind of funny looking back because all that happened is that the boat went over my head as it rested on top of the water and it blocked out the sun. And as soon as I could see light, I quickly uh, kicked my feet and got up to the surface and got back into the boat. But for a brief second, for the only time in my life, I knew what it felt like to be drowning. And this psalmist uses this as a description He says, God, I'm pouring myself out to you. It's as if I cannot swim and I am drowning in my pain. Then he goes on and uses a second metaphor, um, one that I can't relate to. But he says that he cannot find any foothold because he is sinking in what would appear to be miry clay or or maybe quicksand he was sinking and sinking and sinking and there was no place that he could catch his feet no shelf to stand on and the more he kicked the deeper he went that's what his pain was like the more he tried to do the worse his situation came became the passage goes on and he says that he looked for God everywhere. His eyes scanned the horizon, looking for God to come to his aid. And he looked so long that he had eye strain and couldn't see any more. He couldn't focus to look for God. As I've explained that to you, that's pretty descriptive language, isn't it? That's pretty descriptive language. Maybe some of you right now as you're listening to me are going through pain like that. Maybe some of you listening are feeling like your eyes just will not focus in your search for God any longer. Maybe some of you feel like You are drowning and you can't see your way to the surface. Maybe some of you feel like you're thrashing around in quicksand. If you feel that way today, let me ask you, have you told God? Have you laid your heart bare before God and explained to Him your condition The psalmist, if you go down to the end of the psalm, the mood changes. So he doesn't only come to God when times are tough 
and when he's filled with pain, he also comes during times in which he's swimming in confidence. Listen to the words of verse 30 to 35. He said, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with his horns and hoofs. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. My Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that moves in them, for God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. Then the people will settle and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. The psalmist in this section praises God for the future deliverance that will come. He vows to praise God with words that will honor God, will bring God glory. He promises to praise God with words of filled with thanksgiving. The emphasis here is on an inner attitude of joy. And he praises God, rejoicing for all the blessings that he has experienced. He expresses his extreme confidence in God, that God will save him, and that one day his people will settle in a land of his own. He expresses confidence in the truth that God will one day come and rescue them, that God will be their salvation. The psalmist, he holds nothing back, and he praises God. He said, I will praise God with a new song, a song on my lips. I will praise God and glorify Him because that pleases God more than sacrifice of an ox, more than shed blood of an animal. Of course, referring to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He says, when you seek God, your hearts will be alive. And we have felt that too. We have been in those times of rejoicing. We have celebrated with thanksgiving. We have glorified God for all the good that we've experienced in life. We have seen times of plenty and we have praised Him for them. The psalmist, his prayer contains it all. He dropped the facade and he told God about his misery and he told God about his joy. How about you? How about you? Are your prayers balanced in this way? Do you talk to God about your pain and misery and do you talk to God about your blessings? Do you talk to God about how difficult it is to live in this world and to battle sin? And do you praise God for the presence of His Holy Spirit and His fortifying presence in your life? Do you complain to God about the difficulty that you are experiencing? And yet, do you thank Him for sending Jesus to die on Calvary's cross to give you meaning and purpose? Are you troubled about what's going on in this world and yet are you praising God because this world is not your home? That's the balance that our prayers need to consist of. Holding nothing back from God. Nothing at all. Now if you think the psalmist was an exception, I want to show you not only his example, but I want to show you our Savior's example. As we read of Jesus' high priestly prayer in the Gospel of John, Jesus exudes confidence that God will glorify him by taking him back to heaven as he has fulfilled his purpose on earth. He longs to return and see the heavenly glory that was part of his before he was born as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. 
And he prays and he explains all of that joy to God. So we see Jesus taught to God while he was on earth during the good times. But he also talked to God during the difficult times. So we have the words of John 17, where Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before I existed. And now we compare that with the words of Luke 22 that say, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. And then the words of Matthew 27, where Jesus cries out to God in prayer again and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus set the example. Jesus praised God during the good times, but wasn't afraid to take his pain to God and to talk to him about it. As we lead our lives after Jesus' example, as we who have embraced him as our Lord and Savior and experience forgiveness through him, we want to live lives after his example for the scriptures tell us to be holy even as God is holy. And Jesus was God in flesh, and so we want to follow his example. Nowhere is this better seen than when it comes to prayer. We're going to pray during the times of blessing, and we are going to pray during the times that we experience the effect of the curse. How do we do that? How do we practice what Jesus is saying and what the psalmist is saying? How do we become our true self, our authentic self before God in prayer? Well, I think the first step is to be honest in prayer and admit that we're dishonest. That's the first step. The first step is to confess our sin. The first step is to recognize the foolishness in what we've been doing and trying to hide our authentic self from the all-knowing God. We need to go before Him and say, God, I've been trying to hide my pain and I confess my sin and ask that You would forgive me. That's step one. And step two is to sink our heart, and our lips. To synchronize our heart and our lips. That we will talk to God about the good and the bad and the ugly. We won't just give lip service and tell God what we think He wants to hear, but rather, we will talk to Him about everything. Sink our heart and our lips Many people have a difficulty doing that. Many people talk a better talk than they walk a walk. And God says in this passage of Scripture that He wants worshipers who are authentic and will work hard to synchronize their inner life with their outer life, their heart with their words the third thing that I recommend that you do is recite this prayer or pray it in your own words. Lord, help me to lead a life of total integrity. May my lips and my heart 
be as one with each other. May my heart not be bitter in times of suffering, nor boastful in times of success. And Lord, in my prayers, help me to speak to you from the depth of my heart. Thank you that you hear the cry of my heart. Practice that prayer in an effort to be authentic before God. As I close, I do so with one more illustration. One of the 20 most popular TED Talks ever was one entitled Lie Spotting by Pamela Mayer. She claims that each and every day that you are lied to between 10 and 200 times. Isn't that overwhelming? That you are lied to between 10 and 200 times. People say things like, the check is in the mail. There'll be something around to mend your boiler. For, sorry, there'll be someone around to fix your boiler first thing in the morning. Or, perhaps the most obvious one, I'm fine, when in reality, I feel like my life's going down the toilet. Sometimes these are empty words. The heart does not accompany the lips. May that no longer be reflective of your conversations with God. As you've listened to me speak this morning, it may be that some of you are thinking, I've never had an authentic conversation with God. God is not relational to me. He's never been my heavenly Father. He's been some abstract being whose name I call only in times of difficulty. It may be for some of you listening today that explaining to the invisible God the real heart issues going on in your life is something that you've never practiced. If that's the case, I invite you to pray this prayer with me and become part of God's family today. God will adopt you and reveal himself to you so that you know that he is caring and nurturing. So that you can know that he can be trusted. So that you can be confident that he is your heavenly father. And that even as he allows you to go through difficulty like COVID on earth, one day you will be with him in his eternal kingdom where there will be no more pandemics. Let's pray. God, I want you to be my father today. I want to have a relationship with you. I confess my sin. I confess that I've been trying to live in hiding so that you wouldn't know the authentic me. I ask today that you would forgive me for these sins and others that I have committed against you. I know that your son Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And I accept him today as my Lord and Savior and ask that you would apply his sacrifice to my account. For I pray in his name. Amen. We are going to conclude our worship service today with the singing of one of my favorite worship songs, and that is, What If His People Prayed?